Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to the second part of our two-part series about unsettling police sketches. If you haven't seen part one, be sure to check that out as well. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, if you enjoy our videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part two of Two Crimes with Unsettling Police Sketches. Unlike the other police sketch in today's series, the image associated with this story is not necessarily unsettling right away. However, if you're like us, that will change for you instantly once you learn the full context of the mystery surrounding it. In the spring of 2008, 72-year-old Hal Wennell and his 60-year-old wife Eva, who went by the name Kay, were living what appeared to be a life that many people would find aspirational. Hal was the president of a successful real estate company that specialized in developing shopping centers, a career which had made him a multimillionaire. Kay was a former model who had left the business and had later started working for her husband, spending much of her time finding tenants for his shopping centers. Though both had previously been in multiple marriages that didn't work out, Kay and Hal had been happily married for nearly 20 years. They had spent much of that time traveling around the world and living in various places across the United States, but in recent years had settled down in Georgia, in the affluent Lawrenceville neighborhood of Sugarloaf Springs. Despite now getting on in their years, the elderly couple were fairly active, with Hal in particular still putting in long hours at his company. It seemed like the pair were still looking forward to many more wonderful years ahead together and had even planned to move into an even nicer property in the near future, since their house in Sugarloaf Springs was a rental. However, a sudden tragedy would soon derail everything. May 1st, 2008 started off a little bit different than most mornings for the Wennells. Though both Hal and Kay usually went to work, that day Kay said she wasn't feeling well and decided to stay home. Hal continued on with his usual routine and went into the office. Just a side note, there are some sources that claim that Kay later joined her husband at work for lunch that day, though we were unable to verify this. Regardless, by that afternoon, Kay was at home and Hal was busy finishing the rest of his workday. However, during the course of that afternoon, Hal found that he was unable to get a hold of his wife at their house. It's unclear how many times he tried to contact her, but what we do know is that when he left his office shortly before 6 p.m., he had still failed to hear back from her. When Hal finally got home a short time later, he soon found out why. Kay was lying in a pool of her own blood on the kitchen floor. Her throat had been slashed, and she appeared to have been punched several times in the face. Hal ran to a neighbor's house and called 911, However, by the time emergency responders arrived, it was far too late. It was later determined that Kay had likely been murdered sometime between 1 and 3 p.m. that afternoon. Despite the violent nature of the crime, police struggled to find evidence that could shed light on the identity of Kay's killer. There were no signs of forced entry at the home, and nothing appeared to have been stolen, despite the fact that the house contained many valuables that were out in the open. The only thing that appeared to have been left behind by the killer was a bloody towel in the closet of Kay and Hal's master bedroom. However, no DNA or other physical evidence was initially found by detectives. With robbery seemingly ruled out as a motive, authorities concluded that Kay's murder was likely personal in nature. Understandably, it was at that point that they turned their attention towards Hal Wennell. However, here too, Investigators struggled to uncover a motive. By all accounts, Hal and Kay were happily married and deeply in love, and Hal seemed to have nothing to gain from killing his wife. Neither the Wennells' family or friends were aware of any problems in their marriage, and Hal seemed genuinely devastated by his wife's loss. When emergency responders initially arrived at the scene of Kay's murder, they had found Hal lying next to his wife's body on the floor, begging them for help. 
Those who had witnessed his reaction at the scene felt that his response was too genuine to have been faked. On top of that, when Hal was cleared of suspicion by detectives three weeks into the investigation, he immediately set up a $100,000 reward for information leading to the capture of his wife's killer, eventually raising that sum to $250,000. He also hired his own team of private investigators. With Hal no longer the focus of the investigation, authorities were left with few leads to pursue. Though they were still convinced that the killer had to have known Kay, and was likely someone that she would have opened the door for without a second thought, no one in her life could recall her having any enemies, nor did they know of anyone who might have wanted to hurt her. The one exception to this concerned an eyewitness account of a mysterious man who had been seen walking in the neighborhood near the Wennells' home on two different occasions. First, a few days before Kay's murder, and then again on the day of the murder itself. The man was described as clean-shaven, with graying brown hair and wire-rimmed glasses. Based on the witness account, a sketch of the man's face was made, but it didn't appear to be a match to anyone living in the neighborhood. Likewise, the man didn't seem to bear any resemblance to anyone that the Wennells knew. Police again were at a loss. A few months after Kay's murder, the investigation would heat up again, when out of the blue, a mysterious note was received at the Norcross Bureau of the news outlet, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The note was composed using letters that had been cut out of magazines, and appeared to have been written by Kay Wennell's killer. As a side note, the letter includes excessive profanity, so we're going to read it out while substituting the word blank for any expletives. We're sure you'll get the gist anyway. It read, quote, I bet Kay Wennell never told anybody what she really was. It turns out that she was just a money-grubbing blank. I loved her. She said we could be together. She told me that she hated her house and that fat, miserable, lying mother blanking husband. She said she loved me, but that was a lie, too. I told her this would happen if she didn't keep her blank promises to me. Her blank family screwed everything up. Those white trash blanks. His money was more important than our love. We could have been so happy together, but they blanked everything up. When the Atlanta Journal-Constitution turned the letter over to investigators, they believed that it was genuine and that it had likely been written by Kay's killer. They further concluded that the disturbing and profanity-laden rant was further proof that Kay Wennell's murder had been personal in nature. However, with no particular suspects in mind, it was unclear if the person who wrote it had been in a genuine romantic relationship with Kay, as the letter suggested. Hal told police that he had no knowledge or any reason to believe that his wife had been unfaithful, a sentiment that was echoed by Kay's family and those close to her. It seemed just as conceivable that Kay had been murdered by someone who had been obsessed with her from afar, a person who had perhaps murdered her when they realized their fantasized relationship would never come to pass. Unfortunately, though the letter was tested for physical evidence, no DNA or useful fingerprints could be extracted from it. While the case was now more mysterious than ever, it would soon go cold. However, one more surprise was still coming. Just a little over two years after his wife's murder, in June of 2010, Hal Wennell died of a heart attack while attending a business meeting. As is often the case when someone passes away, this left Hal's family with the task of sorting through a lifetime of his possessions and memories, meticulously deciding what to keep, sell, or throw away. Little did those family members know that this process would unearth a chilling potential lead in the investigation of Kay's murder. While reports contradict each other about how exactly the discovery was made, at some point, family members stumbled across some old photographs belonging to Hal and turned them over to police. Disturbingly, this collection of photos contained several of a man who bore an uncanny resemblance to the composite sketch of the unknown man seen outside of the Wennell's house, both before and on the day of Kay's murder. The man in the photos had a short beard, but at other times was clean-shaven. He had brown receding hair and wore wire-rimmed glasses. At least one of the photos was time-stamped from 1987, 
and appeared to be from when the Wennells lived in Las Vegas. In some of the photos, the unknown man was standing with Hal and Kay. Compared side by side, many believed that the man in the pictures and the man in the police sketch could be the same person, especially if you accounted for the fact that the man in the pictures would have been 20 years older at the time he was seen by the witness. However, just as it happened to investigators before, it didn't take long for them to run into another brick wall. When Hal and Kay's friends and family were asked about the man in the photographs, no one had any idea who he was. Though this might seem somewhat strange at first, the photo was more than 20 years old by the time it was discovered. Because Kay and Hal moved around a lot during the time they were together, it's possible that the man was simply someone who had been in their lives for a short amount of time, perhaps a business associate of Hal's whom he had lost touch with over the years. This might explain why Hal himself also didn't make the connection between the police sketch of the unknown man and the person found pictured in his photo albums while he was still alive. Eventually, in June of 2012, the mysterious letter, the police sketch, and some of the photographs of the unknown man who seemed to resemble him were all released to the public in the hopes that someone out there might be able to shed some light on his identity. However, police were once again disappointed when no one else was able to identify the man either. Though the murder of Kay Wennell remains unsolved to this day, there have been multiple attempts to re-examine the case in the years since the 2012 evidence was shared. A couple of these re-examinations have revealed new details that were never divulged to the public at the time of the initial investigation. The most substantial of these re-examinations was covered on the CBS program 48 Hours in 2017. The show brought together the private detectives that had been hired by Hal Wennell before his death, as well as a retired Gwinnett County police lieutenant who also worked Kay's case back in 2008. There were two areas in particular that 48 Hours focused on in their report that are worth mentioning here. The first concerns the Wennell's marriage, and the second concerns Hal's business. First. Though reports up until 2017 always mentioned that the idea of Kay having an affair held no water, 48 Hours uncovered evidence that this was not the case. Not only had she apparently had affairs in her previous relationships, but the program alleged that she had actually still been married to her third husband when she initially started seeing Hal. According to the report, at some point, Hal even considered the possibility that Kay's third husband may have been involved in her murder, and suggested that authorities look into him. Additionally, he told them that a few months before the murder, the ex-husband had actually contacted Kay. He was traveling to Atlanta and wanted to see her and Hal. Apparently, Kay told him that they weren't going, and he reacted to this news poorly. However, there was no evidence tying him to the case. On the other hand, the investigators hired by Hal said that there was reason to believe that Kay could have been having an affair. They claimed that when a search of the Wennell house was conducted by police, an assortment of fetishware was recovered. They therefore believed that Kay had a private life that most people did not know about, one that it's unclear if Hal knew about either. This would seem to lend credence to the idea of the spurned lover theory. Perhaps Kay had been seeing one or multiple people at the time that she was murdered. Maybe one of them was responsible, and they had been the one that had also sent the letter. However, it's possible that this was also a red herring, leading us to the second major theory covered in the 48 Hours report, which deals with Hal's business. According to the investigators featured in the program, though Hal Wennell seemed like the picture of success, it wasn't actually clear how much money he had. He had definitely made millions of dollars developing his shopping properties, though some have alleged that his business practices weren't always 100% legitimate. According to one of Hal's former assistants, he made his money by developing his properties and then selling them for a profit by giving buyers the impression that the units inside were fully leased by tenants. The assistant said that Hal sometimes employed shady accounting practices to do this, and that she knew of at least one deal in Lawrenceville where Hal had allegedly paid the rent of multiple tenants in order to make it look like the property was making money when it was sold to a buyer. Though Hal told police that he had no enemies during the initial investigation into his wife's death, 
48 Hours discovered that there were actually at least six lawsuits filed against him and his various companies by people claiming that he had defrauded them. This led the team re-examining the case to theorize that perhaps Kay's murder was revenge against Hal that had been carried out by someone he had burned in the business world. They pointed out that this would potentially explain why the crime scene was so devoid of evidence. It could have been a professional hit. This theory of the case further speculated that the mysterious letter sent to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution may have been an attempt to throw investigators off of the trail of the true perpetrator. It would also seem to explain why no physical evidence was found on the letter, either. The final thing worth mentioning from the 48 Hours report is the additional details it included concerning the witness account of the man seen near the Wennells' house. Apparently, the witness was a neighbor of the Wennells who had first noticed the mysterious man a few days before the murder. Apparently, the man was carrying a flyer for a house that was for sale in the neighborhood, the type that is normally only given to people who actually go to see a house in person. However, apparently, there had been no showings on the day the neighbor saw the man, and the flyer for the house in question was on the opposite side of the neighborhood from the Wennells' house, so he presumably had even less of a reason to be near Hal and Kay's property. The mysterious man also caught the neighbor's attention because he didn't appear to have a vehicle nearby. This was strange to him because it apparently wasn't the type of neighborhood where you could really walk to get anywhere. The neighbor was even more concerned when he saw the same man near the Wennell's house on the day of Kay's murder. Though this certainly ups the creepiness factor surrounding the still unidentified man, it unfortunately doesn't seem to have gotten investigators any closer to solving the crime. Was the man someone who knew the Wennells, as his uncanny resemblance to the man in their photo album suggests? Was he possibly someone else who had been hired to carry out the murder, or else had been having an affair with Kay? Or was he simply a random passerby with no connection to the case whatsoever? The frustrating truth is that we just don't know, and in our opinion, it makes the police sketch of the man all the more haunting. The most recent update we could find about the Kay Wennell case was from a 2019 article on the true crime media outlet Oxygen, which mentioned that an investigator named Paul Holes was working on the case. Holes is best known for his work in helping to identify the Golden State Killer in 2018. According to Oxygen, Holes had the bloody towel that was found in the Wennell's master bedroom tested again for DNA, and this time an unknown male DNA sample was detected. At the time, he told Oxygen that the next step in the case would be to utilize genetic genealogy techniques to see if a match to the sample could be found. However, it's unclear if any movement has yet been made on this. As we have seen over the past couple of years, genetic genealogy is an extremely powerful tool which is rapidly helping investigators to close all sorts of cold cases. It therefore seems like there's a good chance that Kay Wennell's murder can still be solved. If so, perhaps we will finally be able to settle the mystery of who the man in the police sketch is, and what his connection to this case is, once and for all. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.